All right, can we hear me? Cool. Okay. Yep, that's right. I'm I'm Kat. I'm going to be talking about what Indigenous knowledge systems or Indigenous thinking or Indigenous epistemologies can teach us about building sophisticated ethical tech. Um, it's so nice to see so many familiar faces in the crowd. It's a nice, cosy audience. So thank you very much for coming along this morning. There are so many wonderful tracks and wonderful speakers. So I'm very privileged that you chose to come here and listen to me. Uh, firstly, thank you to all the amazing sponsors who made this, this conference possible today. Without their, their dedication and support, we all wouldn't be able to be here and do this. So thank you, sponsors. And I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution to the way to the life of this city and this region. The First Nations peoples were the first scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. And I extend my respect to our elders, past and present, and I extend that respect to any of my First Nations brothers and sisters, aunties or uncles who might be listening today. So I'm Kat. Um, this is the kind of simplified version of me. I say technologist because it's become a nice catch-all to describe the various hats that I've worn in the industry. I used to work in analytics and then I moved to product management or product development and now I'm a consultant again uh, over at ThoughtWorks. Uh, I've worked in the tech industry for about seven or eight years and I used to build things but now I simply know enough JavaScript to be dangerous. Uh, I'm also a Noongar woman. I grew up in Esperance and that continues to be the place that I feel the closest connection to country. And I'm an activist, which sounds edgy, but mostly I just read a lot of legislation and do a lot of panels. I serve on the board of Electronic Frontiers Australia, fighting for digital rights. Wandering through the conference this morning, I feel like I should make a small apology, just in case you Google my name and find the panel that I did on Wednesday for ABC Radio Perth. A caller phoned in and said that whenever they're on the phone to their bank, they unplug their Google Home. Um, and I suggested they throw it into the ocean. So I'm sorry to anyone who works for a company who might smell, sell smart homes. Um, but that's, that's the lens that I'm bringing today. Uh, so as I'm talking about ethical or responsible technology, I'm approaching this topic from these specific lenses. And I found that working in technology and engaging with activism are quite similar. They're both about, oh my God, this <laughs> okay, working in tech and engaging in activism, they're both very similar. They're about imagining different versions of the world and trying to usher them into existence. So at the center of this Venn diagram is where my career has led me now. I'm a lead consultant at ThoughtWorks, and I've recently started managing their First Nations Delivery Center, which is an initiative to create remote first careers in technology for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in my obligatory plug page, um, for building Indigenous tech careers, working alongside communities and institutions, developing, strengthening and supporting education and employment pathways, and growing my fully remote delivery centre. So you may have seen this map before. It's a representation of the different language groups in this country. I come from Raju and Murning people on the south coast of Western Australia. And while I honour my connection to those communities, I cannot speak for them, nor can any individual. And one thing I want to highlight, which I think this map makes really clear, is that Indigenous cultures are not monolithic. Each area on this map represents a country. Over 300 distinct groups of people with their own culture, language, customs, knowledge systems and law. But there are commonalities, even with other Indigenous cultures in other parts of the world. And when I say indigenous epistemologies or knowledge systems, this includes how to navigate complex kin systems, collective well-being, knowledge of flora and fauna, and astronomy. Sorry, this bug is just really, it's really distracting me. It's moving closer and closer. Hang on. It's a, <laughs> is it a bug or is it a tick? There you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Cara, a woman of many talents. Um, so, 
These knowledge systems reflect over 60,000 years of refined knowledge and understanding of how to live with complex adaptive systems. So when I hear that, I can only sit in awe and reverence of the cultures that we get to live with today. In order to sustain continuous cultures for so many thousands of generations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have used sophisticated knowledge systems to live in balance with this country's ecology. These are the Buerarina fish traps. They're a complex arrangement of stone walls situated in the Bowen River, which feeds into the Darling River. The oldest and largest structure of human origin, we suspect these are thousands of years old, and they represent sophisticated technology design across differing fields of environmental sciences, including water ecology, animal migration and geography, engineering, hydrology, and fish ecology. Knowledge that has been refined and adapted over time, solidified in physical space and built to endure. The engineering of this stone fish nets allowed the Yemba people to trap fish sustainably at different heights of the river. And the fascinating thing to me is not just the products of technology that emerge from indigenous knowledge systems like these fish traps, but the information architecture that processes that enable them. I think Angie Abdullah articulates this pretty perfectly. She says, indigenous knowledge is transmitted through strict compressed oral law to ensure its veracity, reverence, relevance, and ability to sustain and nurture all life. This could be conceived as akin to code or coding. One of my favorite examples of indigenous knowledge literally embedded into the technology that we use comes from the Americas. This is a woven Navajo rug that featured in a pamphlet celebrating the opening of a new Fairchild semiconductor facility in the 60s. These rugs, while beautiful, also represent generations of knowledge and craftsmanship. The production work in that facility relied on fairly cheap labor of indigenous peoples. And designing circuit boards, it turns out, also requires the same kind of dedication to craft and imagination when it comes to using the limited real estate efficiently and effectively. And when I look at these circuit boards, I can't help but imagine what other ways of thinking or particles of culture have been neglected by dominant industries that could teach us about building the future of technology. What of basket weaving or land management or navigating complex kinship systems? Indigenous knowledge systems is an enormous topic and translating between cultures inevitably compresses complexity, particularly when we're condensing this knowledge into a 45 minute time slot. But there are some themes that I want to specifically talk about. Uh, so learning about indigenous knowledge systems and their relationship to modern technology, I've noticed these themes of sovereignty, custodianship, and really relationality. They regularly appear in cultures, both here in Australia and abroad. Bonjalung Dungadi and Mwagoman Leeton Lee describes indigenous knowledge systems like this. When we consider knowledge systems from a First Nations perspective, we're looking at the many interconnected relationships or pieces of knowledge that overlap and interact with each other without conflict. This is often referred to as kinship or balance. When First Nations communities think in systems, we're seeing how the interrelated parts of an ecosystem or set of knowledges relate to one another and are continuously shaped by these interrelationships. Indigenous knowledge systems are not necessarily items or pieces of information in discrete units or artifacts, but methods of understanding the world, which leads us to systems theory. I'll give a quick primer in systems theory, and I won't go into too much detail because that is a whole other talk, but a system is essentially a set of things interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. As technology becomes more complicated and abstracted, being familiar with systems theory as a way of thinking can help us make sense of the world that we're creating. A classic feature of a system is this feedback loop. There's elements or nodes or actors in a system, some kind of interconnectedness or relationships between those elements, protocols or rules that govern how the elements behave in relationship to one another, and a goal or function of the system. What is it doing? What is its purpose? 
But one thing I want to remember is that technology isn't neutral. We like to think that technologies like machine learning or other types of algorithmic decision making as purely rational and scientific because we've somehow abstracted ourselves away from their output. But anything built by humans or any human design system will exhibit bias. The risk is, as more people rely on technology for daily activities, they're also more subject to unintended and downright hostile consequences. So what kind of protocols or rules currently govern the technology that we're building today? For any profit-driven initiative, it might look like collect, mine, extract, gather as much information and data from as many different sources as possible without any plan of what to do with them or why you're collecting it. Automate everything, break any task into smaller tasks to achieve endlessly increasing productivity, and limitless growth. The perverse incentive of limitless growth is often unfathomable to cultures who have maintained balance with country and refined knowledge to persist for millennia. And I want to reiterate that there's nothing inevitable about these parameters or rules that we apply to pick technology that we can build we can choose new ones. And the thing about a system is that they have a terrible tendency to produce exactly and only what you ask them to. In other words, the purpose of a system is what it does. When we see unintended consequences of the tools that we build, rather than write those consequences off as aberrations or outliers, we must recognize the system is doing exactly what it was told to do and take some responsibility. We need to build for misuse and abuse cases, not just use cases. And good intentions, while necessary, are not sufficient. If the purpose of a system is what it does, at the moment the system is setting the ocean on fire and over-policing people of color. So what is ethical or responsible technology? Uh, essentially, it's technology that seeks to support us and not exploit us. If we seek to address fractured political, economic, and social systems, I suspect indigenous knowledge systems could be critical to this new way of building. And we can break down this process of building ethical technology through these multiple lenses, which I've borrowed from a very thorough ThoughtWorks guide. Uh, it isn't simply about having one person in the room taking your product and waving an ethics wand over it before you go to market, but it's about interrogating systematically the inputs, outputs, and ways of working at every step of production. It's about capability, constantly improving with the organization and its products. It's about diversity, making sure that there is a range of viewpoints in the room from the very start of a project, and making sure multiple stakeholders are considered. It's a remarkably difficult act to imagine the viewpoint of someone else. More difficult than we expect. That's why building diverse teams is so important. It isn't just a tick a box exercise on your wrap, but critical to building technology whose purpose is to enhance collective well-being. It's also about methodology, informalizing ethical processes where feasible, and inquiry, systematically asking those tough questions. At the beginning of this year, I was fortunate to participate in an Indigenous Protocols in Artificial Intelligence incubator. It was uh, coordinated by Angie Adela and Tyson Yunkaporta, who Hannah mentioned in the keynote this morning. And the intention of building these protocols is to protect Indigenous communities and natural resources, help prove, improve ailing AI, reduce the harms of AI, position Indigenous peoples as leading developers, to create respectful and nourishing relationships with artificial intelligence, and to project thanks towards technologies. So many of these protocols I talk about today emerge from this working group, which I share with Commission. I want to take a step back and elaborate on what an acknowledgement means. At the beginning of my talk and at the beginning of the conference today, we go through this acknowledgement that become a commonplace ritual for a lot of events over the past few years, so it would be very easy to become fatigued, like saying a word over and over until it loses its meaning. But the land we're on today is unceded, which means it was stolen forcefully and often violently. 
Acknowledging that uninterrupted connection to country in spite of displacement, disenfranchisement, is one step towards addressing the injustices that Indigenous people have endured and continue to endure. Australia is also the only Commonwealth country to not have a treaty with its Indigenous peoples who live across this country. A treaty, amongst other things, would recognise this thing called Indigenous sovereignty. So the concept of sovereignty is often used to describe the independence of nation states. Uh, it's an entity's right to exercise authority and govern its own affairs without interference and a means for Indigenous peoples to seek greater control of their lives with limited government, government interference in Indigenous affairs. And it might manifest as self-determination or autonomy or agency. And when thinking about sovereignty in the context of technology, one way this emerges is through Indigenous data sovereignty, which allows Indigenous peoples to have control over how data is solicited, collected, analysed and operationalised. And here data may include the digitised collection and storage of traditional knowledge, culture and languages. One way that we ensure sovereignty in our own work at ThoughtWorks can be seen in our approach to Jyla, an open source framework built by thought workers to allow communities with endangered languages to build apps that help preserve their culture. This project predates me by a few years, but it was one of those projects that instantly made me feel proud to work where I do. The framework itself is free to use, so any language group can use these tools in their own language for revitalization efforts, and apps are developed in close consultation and collaboration with those language groups and any output or app is owned by the traditional custodian. So I'd like to set a new standard for the way that we approach building tech. I argue that the protocols that we extend to indigenous or other vulnerable groups should form the new standard of caretaking when building technology or handling data. In its current state, digital platforms like Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or really any website across the internet collect data from its users with insatiability. Shoshana Zuboff uses the term surveillance capitalism to describe the operating model of surveilling customers to collect data, create audiences of like-minded people and incrementally influence human behavior. It's a system that sees data as the new oil and people as fracking opportunities in a wildly imbalanced brokerage relationship between platforms and companies with an abundance of information and power and users who see very little about how their behavior is mined for profit. And it's a system devoid of respect for human agency and autonomy. And I think it's on all of us to build something about that. So everything exists in relation to something and the system it lives in. Relationality refers to the relationships and responsibilities between peoples, country, entities, stories, both human and non-human. And it recognizes country as an entity in itself. How can we design technology that recognizes how humans and non-humans are related to and interdependent on each other? In this essay titled Making Kin with the Machines, Jason Edward Lewis reckons with this idea of how to relate with technology through an Indigenous lens. They suggest Indigenous epistemologies are much better at respectfully accommodating the non-human. It's not a new concept to assign agency and autonomy to non-human entities or show them the due respect or reverence they deserve when looking at it through an Indigenous perspective. They also go on to say, we retain a sense of community that is articulated through complex kin networks anchored in specific territories, genealogies, and protocols. And ultimately, our goal is that we as a species figure out how to treat these new non-human kin respectfully and reciprocally, and not as mere tools or worse, slaves to their creators. So these are the kind of protocols that might emerge from this concept of relationality. Defined protocols in relation to handling sacred images, text, audio, it's a standard practice to provide context warnings, for example, before showing depictions of deceased Aboriginal peoples to allow for appropriate cultural protocols to be followed. Similarly, anticipating these cultural pathways and interpretations for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous groups of people may assist with content moderation. In its present form, 
content moderation is typically a platform-wide exercise leading to content that is frequently banned to appease the lowest common denominator or highest bid. This doesn't necessarily reflect the nature of our society. If we could allow groups of people to define their own protocols or content warnings, we can shift responsibility away from platforms and closer to the traditional custodians of that information rather than the impossible task of delivering material appropriate to every person on the planet. The terms of use of data sets ought to be determined by the communities related to them in close consultation with those communities and data should not leave country without the permission of the custodian. There is also this concept of multi-generational custodianship of data in the same way that we might create handover documentation as we're leaving a position or a job and onto something else. We might develop protocols or define ways of working with data as well and how it can be treated respectfully. I want to draw attention to some emerging examples of digitization of cultural knowledge that hasn't followed protocols of custodianship. These are assets available for download from Sketchfab. And many of these artifacts are subject to cultural protocol in their use and sharing. They might be involved in ceremonies or uh, very sacred to particular peoples. These images were brought to my attention by Gabrigal woman Michaela Jade, who runs an indigenous digital skills training program called InDigital. And she argues that these artifacts are sacred, hold cultural knowledge, and are subject to careful custodianship. So why are 3D scans of places and objects not subject to the same respect and the responsibility? There is this risk as technology grows and proliferates of sharing information beyond its intended audience or contributing further to the colonization and violence towards indigenous communities. So if you're working with any kind of indigenous knowledge, cultural practices, references, artifacts, stories, consultation with relevant custodians is essential. In the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, they say each person, human or no, is bound to every other in a reciprocal relationship. They go on to say, just as all beings have a duty to me, I have a duty to them. If an animal gives its life to feed me, I am in turn bound to support its life. If I receive a stream's gift of pure water, then I am responsible for returning a gift in kind. An integral part of a human's education is to know those duties and how to perform them. This is how we arrive at that kinship and balance of an ecosystem. So custodianship emerges from this idea of relationality as responsibility. When talking about land management, custodianship may mean responsibility and deep connection to lands, waters, animals, plants, and ecosystems. And I want to make the distinction between custodianship and ownership. Modern technology built from Western epistemologies prioritizes this custodianship of this concept of ownership. Uh, this is mine, whatever I've collected belongs to me and I can make a profit off it someday probably. Custodians have a responsibility, on the other hand, to care for country and recognize that country, health and culture are all connected. So particularly when thinking about data governance and data protection, we can apply this concept of custodianship and taking only what you need and extend it to data minimization practices. So, who are the custodians of digital landscapes? If they don't exist in a physical space, it's hard to tell who owns it or who is the custodian of it. But arguably, we are all custodians. Every person who has a hand in building technology has some responsibility to the outcomes of those digital systems. The internet is a shared resource, like an environmental one, like food or water. And perverse incentives like limitless growth and mining human behavior for profit can be antithetical to a world that wants to enhance collective well-being. In the book Future Histories, Lizzie O'Shea talks a little about drawing on the works of indigenous activists to create better digital futures. She says, we need to create a digital environment that is not owned by anyone or any entity, that is preserved and protected for a shared future 
based on a culture of mutual respect. And this is a sentiment that I carry into my own work, but I think it has the chance to proliferate through the networks and shared infrastructures of our industry. So these are some of the viewpoints and protocols that I'm beginning to embed into my own practices of building technology. Uh, and as I'm learning how to build more diverse teams as well. And I want to leave you with some notes about creating space for Indigenous technologists on your teams if you manage to find any, uh, and good luck. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples make up roughly 3% of the general population and closer to 0% of the tech industry. Um, we think the number is sitting around 100 software developers in Australia. Uh, and I think I probably know all of them by name. So good luck. Um, <laughs> building a diverse team by throwing a bunch of differently experienced people into a room isn't necessarily sufficient to building ethical technology. But also, it's important to create safe space. And not all spaces are made equal. We may leverage tools and platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to find our mates, but that isn't their business model. These platforms are more like data farms that also happen to be good at connecting people. So when we're navigating our teams in this industry using digital tools designed to extract and conquer, sovereignty is already something to be reclaimed rather than baked into its scaffolding. We need spaces that not only serve us, but protect us too. And a culturally safe space is one where we can find appropriate support, a space where people can ask for help from members of their own community and know the support we receive will be culturally relevant. The cultural shockwaves of the Black Lives Matter movements across the US, which have reverberated into our own reflection of Australia's treatment of First Nations people, have carried with it a swarm of well-meaning allies who want to do more to support us, but please don't expect Indigenous peoples to be your personal educators when reckoning with your own journey. And this particularly includes expecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on your teams to do cultural work outside of their job description, such as advising or consulting on matters of cultural protocol. And people sometimes have a sense of entitlement when it comes to culture. There's this Western view that stories are meant to be told and culture is meant to be shared, but we have our own very sacred protocols to navigate when engaging with culture, who to ask permission from, to which stories are allowed to be told with which kind of people, and negotiating who has access to the stories of our old people is fundamental to preserving their integrity. So as I said, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make up 3% of the population, but closer to 0% of the tech industry. It's more of a rounding error, really. And there's something about knowledge systems that have successfully transferred information from one, tech, from one generation to the next for tens of thousands of years that floors me. And bringing a multitude of experiences and ways of thinking to a team means we're better placed to avoid building hostile technology and a future of ethical technology designed to maximize all of our well-being. All right, okay, I have a further reading list on my website, but otherwise, thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. Thanks so much, Kat. Really great to get that insight. I'm sure Kat will be around for the rest of the day if anyone wants to ask questions.